Mike Perham may be just an ordinary 16-year-old schoolboy, but his dreams are far from ordinary. Yeah, I'm trying to do revision. <laughs> trying to. I spend half my time daydreaming. That's <laughs> all my attention spans like. <laughs> and what are you daydreaming about? You know, how amazing would it be to sail around the world? You know, what one incredible journey that would be. His dream is to become the youngest person ever to sail alone and non-stop around the world. I think more people have been into space. It's a voyage of four months and 30,000 miles which has claimed the lives of grown men and driven experienced sailors to madness. It's one of the toughest challenges on Earth. Most people understand that they're not mentally tough and experienced enough to do it. And yet Mike's father, a surveyor from Potter's Bar, shares his ambition. Oh, well, OK, I, I can't suggest that uh, he's not living so in my dreams. Though they've raised just a fraction of the planned budget and run out of time for sea training, they're determined to set sail. I didn't feel they'd had enough training. The boat Mike was on right now is a, is a weapon. Would you be prepared to hold a funeral service without a body to bury? Well, it has to be yes. Plagued with problems from the start. I seriously ripped sail. I've just had to... Jump in the water. Mike's extraordinary ambition seems almost certain to fail. I just feel this dream slipping away. Unless he can prove that he's no ordinary schoolboy, after all. Try, Mike, you can do this. Ah. Woo! Woo! We've got some whales. Come on, keep smiling. Mike Perham is sitting his final school exams and finding it hard to concentrate. The financial world rocks to the biggest bankruptcy in history. His father is also struggling to raise any money for his son's ambitious dream. Thank you very much. All right, bye. Just a few weeks after his GCSEs, Mike has to face some much tougher questions. How dangerous is it? How many, you know, have people lost their lives doing so? There, there have been one or two who have lost their lives doing this. Um, however, most of the people who have lost their lives, you know, sailing, are those people who just go a bit loopy in the head and literally step off the side of the boat. OK, I think, I think we, need to, we need to think about this. We are really running out of time to make this happen. After a nervous lunch, Mike and Peter come back to find that just part of the money they were asking for is on the table. Can we talk about how much the budget is? What, how much the trip costs? Yeah. Uh, overall, it, um, it's, it's about a couple of hundred grand. You know, in very round figures. Good. Mike is taking his girlfriend Becky to see the boat he'll be sailing around the world in. They've only been able to charter the boat for a five-month voyage. It's being refitted for Mike in France. How sexy is the orange and black? Totally different type of boat to the one in the original plan. They've gone from an unsinkable cruiser to a full-on racing machine, which some think is too much for a 16-year-old to handle. It's a crazy boat. We owned it. Nick Maloney, one of our skippers, did the route the rum, single handed transatlantic race in 2002 in it. And he'd done three around the world's America's Cup, and it scared the hell out of him. And how will you know which one does what? The rest of them are labelled. When you charter a boat, or like when you hire a car, you take it at face value. And that's what we did, maybe naively. In its day, this was a top racing boat, but it's now 12 years old and has already been round the world twice. You have a window at the back? Yeah. <laughs> what? Escape hatch. Escape hatch? Yep. It means if the boat tipped over and was upside down, if it lost its keel, then um, you'd be able to crawl out the back rather than have to come out the main hatch to swim underwater and out. That's what I needed to know. Yeah. No, oh, you asked the I'm question. Yes, I know. I hadn't thought of that answer. The refit is taking longer than expected. So far, Mike's only managed to sail his boat for two days. Having read about Michael's plans, I, I decided to ring up 
and spoke to both him and his father, and I judged that the amount of preparation they were, had done and were planning to do wasn't sufficient, in my opinion. Have you sailed it on your own? No. No, I, I haven't sailed the boat on my own yet, and um, chances are I probably won't be able to sail it completely on my own right up until the start line. As Mike intends to sail around the world non-stop, he needs to take all his food and supplies with him. Right, we need lots and lots of batteries. Yeah, but they're not on offer. It costs a fortune. Hmm? Okay. Five, six, seven, eight. Huh? Twenty. Well, that's one a week. A supermarket has sponsored Mike with the mother of all trolley dashes. This is ridiculous. Fine, yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The food's then packed in into 23 waterproof bags, one for each week of the voyage. To add to the pressure on Mike, a 16-year-old American has begun his own circumnavigation. We knew that Zach Sunderland, the American, was sailing around the world. And so we thought, well, if Mike's going to get the world record, and he is three and a half months younger than, than Zach Sunderland, he's got to go on a certain date. That was one of the most um, scary, exciting, upsetting days of ever. You, you can't plan how you're going to feel or how you're going to react with something like this. Good morning. What a daunting task it is to sail around the world, let alone sail around the world when you're 16. Uh, woke up this morning, it actually hits you, you know, today's the day, it's all happening. Yeah. Haven't eaten much. Michael Poem is going to be making history in a couple of minutes' time, setting off for what will be the greatest journey I'd imagine that any schoolboy had ever made. I thought we'd have, you know, this really long goodbye. I, could, I couldn't get any words out. I didn't really know what to say. And then as soon as he left, I wish I'd said more. I'm basically a person that will cry at anything, whether happy or sad. I couldn't do it that day. And as a father waving off um, his 16-year-old son, you know, around the world, how, how are you feeling? Are you worried? Are you concerned? Uh, well, I've had butterflies in my stomach for quite some time, really. I was just trying to collect myself that I, I wouldn't um, fall apart, I suppose. As his father prepares to step off the boat for the last time, Mike's nerves get the better of him. It's relevant angle, remember? He seems to have forgotten the basics. Look at the wind. Look. Stand here. Stand here. Just stand. Which way is the wind? Seriously, when you look at the wavelets. It's roughly in line now with that beacon, that tack cone, isn't it? Exactly. Right? As I say, I think if you wanted to put a bit more main up, you could, and I'm prepared here to help you. You're only doing five knots, Mike. How many months are you going to take? Nine? Come on, Dad! No, how can I do that with that? It's full of wind! Get into the wind! Just steer right into the wind. Right into the wind! Please! Mike, right, you'll be fine, right? It's because I'm around, you're, you're asking me lots of questions. Yeah? Yeah, when you're on your own, you just do it, don't you? Hmm? Yeah. yeah? I think it's best if I step off now. Personally.
An hour later, Mike crosses the start line and immediately has his first technical problem. It's the most important piece of equipment on the boat. Here we have the autopilot steering us away. Without the autopilot single-handed, you, you can't carry on. I mean, you, you cannot make it on that kind of boat in particular. Because there's no question of you steering by hand for five months. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How big is this problem? We, don't, we, we didn't really know. And, um, uh, but we sort of decided that he would continue. Mike needs to get clear of the English Channel. It's far too busy for solo sailing. Most ships which run down yachts don't even notice the collision. We're maintaining a happy 10, 11, 12 knots right now, which would be fine. But with, with this autopilot, I'm quite scared, really. Mike's supposed to sleep in 20-minute berths because he has to keep a careful lookout. The autopilot problems mean he can't even do that. After five days at sea, he has no choice but to pull in for repairs. Just a day later, the autopilot is fixed. Mike's non-stop record attempt will now begin and end in Portugal. If we jump inside, you can see the nav area, the galley, I think, and that's where I've been sleeping most of the time. And uh, the boat's in a bit of a mess right now. There's stuff all over the floor. Found some wind! Yeah! I had uh, my first uh, proper shower today. Ooh. Here goes. Ooh. 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 Oh, it's cold. Ooh. I don't want to stay with all the snow on me. I'm just going to put a little bit of fresh water. Just to make it all so we don't have much. We have to be really careful. But only 400 miles from Portugal, the autopilots failed again. To be honest, I'm, uh, I'm really struggling with all these equipment breakages and failures, and still, still the autopilot does not work properly. And, you know, right now it could be a showstopper. Timeline for getting that boat ready to go around the world and testing it properly, and testing it single-handed properly, um, meant that it didn't go through a proper preparation phase, and the results were going to be were pretty obvious and exactly have happened exactly as most people imagined. Well, it's quite scary, and you pray that the boat holds it together. Mike has no option but to make another stop. He heads for Gran Canaria. This time, the autopilot repairs take longer. He just kept saying to me, "Is this ever going to happen? I feel it slipping away." Delay after delay turns the days into weeks. It's the only time of the trip I ask Mike, are you sure we're doing the right thing here? He sounded quite scary on the phone at one point. He was so angry. I'd never seen that side of him before. Two days after Christmas, having spent a month on land, he's finally on his way again. There must be a few hundred dolphins here. As Mike heads out into the Atlantic, he resets his start for the third time. He can't afford to stop again. If he does, He'll forgo his non-stop circumnavigation record. Hey, it's warm. I'm on my way. I'm getting there. I can do it. I can do it. There's lots of little things on this boat which remind me of everyone. Like, um, just little things. Like, these, these five bracelets given to me by Becky. I wore mine for the week. Before he left, he wore his, and then on the day, we swapped bracelets, so he had my ones and I had his. It's a lot to ask of a girlfriend to put up with a boyfriend going away for between four and five months. But uh, she's a good one, and she will. I've got a lot of faith in her. My favourite message. Be safe, be strong, be brave. I love you. Good luck, honey. How do you think this has been so far for Mike? I would say it's been pretty frustrating for him, to be honest. But he's now been going for three days without a hitch. So, fingers crossed, they've sorted the problem. The pilot just cut out again. 
four weeks, four weeks we've spent in the Canaries trying to fix it. Four weeks. It's not just my dream, this trip. It's, it's mine and my dad's. We're like best friends, me and him. Best buddies. Like this. Hello? Hello, Mike. Dad here. We're, we're in Trafalgar Square with Fiona and Uncle David and Auntie Linda. Oh, oh that's cool. Oh, great. Uh, hope you're having a nice time. I realize, uh, I, uh, the bad news is though, Dad, is that um, I saw something wrong with the pilot earlier. And it, wow. And what, what was the problem? Like, uh, it would jump and then the, the wind direction would go from, from like, uh, 20 degrees to 80 degrees. So that would cause the boat to swerve by 60 degrees and back again, back again. That, obviously, that's pretty serious because you can't carry on without the autopilot working properly. What we'll do when we get back home, I'll probably talk to you again, yeah? About what you should be doing. All right, okay. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mike, about that. Okay, I love you lots. That's a bugger. It's probably the crappiest New Year's up ever. Mike's nursing a faulty autopilot, but as the waves strengthen and the winds grow, so does his confidence. Lovely blue skies over there. And look what we've found. Woo, it's work! <laughs> it's a lot of work. You know, to put a Jennifer spinnaker up is an hour's work. Same to take it down. When you get these extremely strong cloud cells coming off, you know, if you went in with all your cells up, you'd tear them instantly. Mike is about to cross latitude 40 south and enter the Roaring Forties, named for the fierce storms which stalk this part of the world. Uh, it's getting a little bit cooler, and uh, last night was the first night that I had to use a uh, blanket to sleep. At the moment I'm being uh, chased by a tropical low, and in the next 24, 48 hours they are uh, Front is going to pass over the boat, which could bring up to 45 knots of wind. So I spent the day just getting the boat a little bit ready. A front pass through last night, giving us uh, pretty hard, strong conditions. And uh, I went to reef the mainsail and uh, decided to back itself around one of my spreaders, which really, really pain in the ass. It took two hours to get it down, and yeah, I uh, damaged two of the lashings during it. It's a very, very long voyage, and there is going to be damage. <sighs> and you've got to be able to cope with that damage. You've got to be able to repair everything on that boat. You've got to be a sail maker a rigger, you might have to be a shipwright, engineer, navigator. And so I had the main sail down on the deck this morning and uh, repairing the lashings. You know, that's uh, the first front of the Southern Ocean I've had and uh, already it's uh, had an effect on the boat. You look after your boat, it'll look after you. You don't look after your boat, you might be committing suicide. Last night's problems are soon dwarfed by another major technical issue. One of the rudders has come loose in its casing. There's about one to two millimeters of plate. It's an awful lot in a, in a rudder bearing. With huge loads on the rudders, 
Once the bearings start moving, they'll soon destroy themselves, leaving Mike unable to steer just as he's about to enter the world's most dangerous ocean. Mike has no option but to head for Cape Town, which finally puts an end to his hopes of sailing non-stop. We knew he couldn't do a non-stop record, and, uh, and so he had to do effectively the lesser record of sailing with stops. Each stop is putting the record further out of reach. Zach Sunderland, who's just three and a half months older than Mike, is already most of the way around the world. Mike now finds himself in a two-teenager race. He's hoping to be away in a week. So we've had to lift about the water. So we brought in a big crane this morning and uh, hoisted her out. But it takes a month to repair the rudder and fit a new autopilot, putting Mike two and a half months behind on his four-month schedule. An ocean away, Becky only has the bracelets to remind her of her sailor boy. I wasn't allowed to wear jewellery. Teachers always say, can you take your bracelets off, please? I was like, no. <laughs> I'm not taking them off, because it, it felt... I don't know. I felt closer to him with it on. Mike's getting closer to winter in the Southern Ocean. It's already autumn. In a couple of months' time, he'll be just a few hundred miles from the Antarctic. In the middle of summer, the Southern Ocean can be one of the most vicious places on the planet for a sailor. Very rapid change of weather conditions. If you go slowly in the Southern Ocean going downwind, you have the greatest chance of being rolled over. Icebergs, fraught with dangers, and that's been the summer. When you get to the winter, you're talking about another ball game. No one goes through the Southern Ocean in winter. Leaving is always hard. I always try and be strong and positive, but um, at that moment, no, I couldn't. I really, I really felt down in the dumps. Really, really felt down in the dumps. It is hard, and that's why not many people do it. But I will do it. I will get around. I've come this far. <laughs> Mike's been lucky enough to have a gentle introduction into the Southern Ocean. He spent his first few days in unusually calm weather. Wow. It's getting much colder. So I've got the soup out. It's really wet outside now. Ooh, this nice warm meal is heating me up. It's getting bloody cold down here. It's my birthday today, 16th of March, woo! And now I'm going to open my presents, the official highway code for driving. <laughs> we hope that you learn to drive as well as you sail. <laughs> no, I wish I could be spending today at home, but this is, this is pretty good. It's a bit upsetting that he's not here, but, you know, we've gone through Christmas and New Year and Valentine's Day. <laughs> Up to this point, the weather's been fairly benign. But now Mike is starting to get a glimpse of why the Southern Ocean is so feared by sailors. Got any specific advice for what sounds like it's going to be the toughest leg that he's going to be in the Southern Ocean? I mean, the uh, best advice, best advice will be to pray. To be honest. And just ten days after his 17th birthday, Mike's going to need all the help he can get. some pretty yeah unpleasant questions would you be prepared to hold a funeral service without a body to bury what was the answer to that well it had to be yes uh, i looked at these waves with, with awe really yeah i'd never seen conditions this big before the strong wind came we were already really set up for it and then all you do is hang on but then freak waves came along now freak waves can be 70 foot high 
this unrelenting sheer force of power which just circles Antarctica. Freak waves can sink big ships, let alone small yachts. It was in the early hours of the morning. I felt, you know, my stomach, whoa, this is a big one. The whole boat was picked up and chucked on our side. And we just kept going and going and going over. And I was thinking to myself, you know, crikey, are we going to invert ourselves and properly capsize? And the wave passed under, and so the keel came back into action. And it went back up right. No, I've never experienced anything like it before. I was sitting on the, um, the bunk at the chart table, and I had to move myself and have my feet on the ceiling for a moment just to support myself. He told me, and I couldn't stop crying. I was on the phone to him, and he was like, no, don't cry, I'm fine, I'm fine. But I was just thinking, I know you're fine now, but oh, what if you hadn't been? You know, you can't help but think the worst. We were well past 90 degrees, and everything went flying across the cabin. Just everything that could fly, flew. And even one of the fuel tanks at the back managed to free itself and come flying across the cabin. And that wasn't nice, because it spilled diesel everywhere, which has made me feel pretty sick. Yet yeah, the boat was fine, pretty much. Yeah, of course there's water everywhere and it knocked out some of the electrics. Yes, it had all those problems, but the boat was seaworthy. And that's all I'm bothered about, really, in the Southern Ocean. It was the scariest part of this trip so far. And I really hope it doesn't happen again. Miraculously, the knockdown has left the rig unharmed, but has destroyed the boat's electrics. Mike is forced to make another stop. That flashing light out there is the entrance to the Hobart. And now, halfway around the world, let's bring on the other half. Now I can do it. Now I can do it. Repairs go well for once. Within six days, they're completed. Mike's ready to sail. When I left Hobart, I was, I was feeling a lot better compared to Cape Town because I'd broken the back of the trip. You know, I thought I could do it now. You know, you've done half. Let's just get back now. You can do it. He's at the bottom of the world and on his way back up. You know, I was about 17 miles out. Well, I am 17 miles out from leaving Hobart. I'm going to check the aft compartment and fuck, it's full of water. I've just had to turn the boat around and head back. And head back. I've been sailing for three hours and, and um, you know, I'd stop crying. Mike spends another month on land, mostly waiting for parts to be made and delivered from France. On the other side of the world, cracks are showing too. Things weren't going the way he wanted. It was making the trip longer. It was making our relationship more awkward because he was always complaining and he was so caught up in it. And I was thinking, what are you doing? Get on with it. <laughs> there are people over here that want you home. Mike finally leaves Hobart around the same time he should have been arriving back in the UK. And so I've just left Hobart. Let's hope I don't have to turn around, eh? So far, Mike's had to stop four times for repairs. He now has to make a fifth stop in New Zealand to fix his rudder again. Meanwhile, Zach Sunderland is on the home straight. If Mike keeps up the same average speed, he'll arrive back too late to take any record. After 11 days, he sets sail again. But he doesn't need to worry about stopping after New Zealand, because there is nowhere to stop. To go between New Zealand and Cape Horn, you are on your own, thousands of miles from land. At this time of year now, no one to rescue you at all. Not a cargo route, there aren't ships coming by, there aren't many big fishing vessels, no way for anyone to help you, no way out. If you make it through it, that's an extraordinary achievement. The downsides, pretty tough. Mike's been coping well with the extremes of weather, but in this part of the world, he'll also have to cope with extreme solitude. Oh, my 
just going to stay in. Yeah. All showered now. All shaved. Uh, so uh, let's go out for a night, eh? Yeah, big party. You know, loads of people there. Nice big club. Mike now has his first sustained period of upwind sailing, sailing into the wind and the waves. Upwind sailing on the open is horrible. Yikes. The hull is just Ouch. flat. Every time we go off a wave, the whole rig shakes, the whole boat slaps, and the keel goes whoa and the engine, which is just below where I'm sitting, goes woo, and um, it's a horrible feeling. It's like the boat's about to fall apart. Yeah! Mike's been pushing north to avoid bad weather, but if he's to round Cape Horn, he'll have to start heading back into the southern winter. Right now, there are 100 mile an hour winds at the Cape. Rounding the Horn at this time of year can be fatal. There is an alternative. Mike can sail across the entire Pacific Ocean and through the Panama Canal. It's further, but safer. It's decision time. In my heart, it's Cape Horn. I love to go there. But, um, but I've made the decision to head for Panama now. It was hard, you know. I, I really wanted to get for the Horn. It's still a dream. But this disappointment soon forgotten. Mike has more immediate problems to deal with. You can just see the beginnings of the squall here. Mike's hit an area of very unpredictable weather. You go from no wind to absolutely loads in 10 seconds. I was struggling to sleep because it's so changeable. You know, dur during the day, I would try and progress as much because during the night, the conditions are always worsen. Welcome to Mike Land. Today, not much is different from yesterday. Mike has been alone for two weeks and has at least three weeks to go before he sees another person. Something not many 17-year-olds have experienced. This were lunch was today. Lunch today was a whole tube of Pringles. Highly unhealthy. No, who gives you that? No one's here to tell me. No, Mike, you can't eat a whole tub of Pringles. That's so unhealthy for you. You'll get so, so fat. <laughs> Looking forward to getting out of these frustrating and tricky conditions, which are just an absolute pain, and into some steadier stuff. Because right now, I just don't know what's coming next. What comes next catches Mike completely unawares. I'd had enough um, in honesty you know he was um, the trip had gotten longer he was now away for about seven and a half months and I had my GCSEs coming up and I just said right okay just take the um, tie away so we did probably since Australia since I was in Australia it started to feel a bit different in a way a lot of people said to me why would you do that? You know, he's he's all alone. Don't do that to him. That's really selfish. But um, to be honest, they have no idea. It's hard for anyone to maintain a relationship over that long a time because we've both changed a bit. You know, she's she's changed. She's gotten much older. I've gotten older. Mm. Are you a cat? I think you are. Let's go say hi to your friend. So what's your name, Cloud? Hi, my name's Ben. And this is my friend James. And that's Adam. Adam's being really mean today. He's bullying us all because he's raining. But James, no, at, at whatever. Hmm. I'm running out of things to do today. Oh, it's ringing. Hello. You're right, mate. It's Stephen. Oh, hey. How you doing? What's happening with you and Becky? Because I don't get told nothing. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're, we're still very, very close. Oh, very, very close. It's just, it's, it's just, I guess, during the whole journey, it's turned in, almost into more of a friendship than a relationship, in a way. 
Yeah, I can you understand know, that. You've been a part for so long, isn't it? I, it must suck going away for that long, like, in one go. Yeah. It is a bit of a, you know, I do miss everyone and hope for a lot. Like, just, just you guys, I miss mean, hanging out with, and, and all the laughs and stuff. Aww. Oh, yeah, we miss you too, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever like take a little dip off the boat, go for a swim, and then leave the boat, and then come back, or whatever? Or do you have to like stay on the boat? No, 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 no. Um, no, I'm sailing a lot faster than, um, than I can swim. So uh, if I jumped off, I'd never catch up. Yeah. So I'd be like, oh, I'm not going to swim anymore. It's a bit of a shame. Swimming is the solo sailor's ultimate nightmare. To leave the safety of the boat goes against every instinct. But when you're this far away from help, you have no option but to face your worst fears. Earlier, Mike allowed a rope to dangle over the side. It drifted under the boat and got wrapped around the rudder. And it had cut off my steering and I couldn't use the rudders. He tried for hours to free the rope, but only succeeded in getting it tangled around the second rudder. It's just getting dark. The sun's just set and, um... Oh, stinging. On his own, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with no steering, Mike stepped off the boat. I just jumped in. In the water for half an hour, he steers the boat as best he can. I had to do it instantly because it will get dark pretty quickly. I got a knife with me and everything and I just had to cut it away. Oh fuck, I'm all stinging. Oh, I was scared that I wouldn't be able to do it before it got dark and then before it'd have no steering. I was scared in the water I was. After the shock of stepping in the water, Mike makes steady progress towards Panama. And it's here. He's going across the equator from south. To the north. One more. And that's it. Back on my side of the world. We're in the northern hemisphere. Woo! Whoa, there we go. Woo! I'm gonna have a little bit for myself. A little bit for the boat, totally money. And also, some for Neptune. Woo! <laughs> and that's just a mass of bubbles. And that much left. <laughs> oh well, I can't get drunk out here. That wouldn't be good at all. Hello, hello, hello. Well, do you know what day it is? I bet you don't, but I do. It is. Hawaiian Day! For no apparent reason! We are nowhere near Hawaii, but hell, who cares? Oh, look, we found a friend! It's a little squid! Mike is now approaching the traffic jam around the Panama Canal. This is the shortcut between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. As we come up here, that's my active echo beeping away, so there's a ship. With very little wind and no engine to get him out of trouble, he'll have to be extra vigilant. Uh, that's right, there's a ship all the way over there. Look at that. It's a massive piece of wood. Almost ran over it. There's so much junk in the water here at Panama. I 
This is crazy. Well, this is worrying. I don't want to hit one of these. Look at this. I would not want to hit that bit of wood. Crikey. There's Panama City! Hey, hey! And there's just some crazy amount of ships here. Oh, look at them all. They're stuck under here. Uh, there. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. Ahoy, Mike! Mike has to stop in Panama to arrange the 20 mile transit through the canal. Do you have a girlfriend back in the UK? Because in Panama, there's a lot of good-looking women. And what happens in Panama stays in Panama. <laughs> in the apartment where Mike's staying in Panama, he has a webcam. Mike and Becky are able to talk face-to-face -face for the first time in eight months. In Panama, we had a, our first webcam conversation. Um, we were on webcam for eight hours that night. We talked about everything, good and bad from the whole trip and what we were going to do when we see each other. Do you think there's a chance that when you get back to the UK you might get back together? Uh, I hope so, actually. I do hope so. Mike has just found out that Zach Sunderland is home and has become the current youngest circumnavigator. Mike's now got just 10 weeks age advantage over the American. He can't afford any more delays or he'll be too old to claim the record he's worked so hard for. It's now been about close to 24 hours since I left Shelter Bay in uh, Panama and I'm pleased to be back in the Atlantic but Last night I had a real problem that uh, whilst I was putting a reef in, my lazy jacks on the port side, the leeward side, snapped. So I'm basically going to have to go up the rig, and it's something I'm really not looking forward to, because we're pounding all over the place. I suppose I don't have a choice, though. In conditions like these, sailors can be knocked unconscious by being slammed against the mast during climbs. I'm just going to let my dad know, though. Hey. I'm going up. Oh, well, OK. Right. I love you, Dad. I'll let you know when I'm down. Up we go. <laughs> it's going to bloody hurt, though. Mike's seen all kinds of weather on his voyage. He survived huge storms, but with no engine, a lack of wind can be just as catastrophic. This time I didn't expect them. I'm just two miles away from the tip of Cuba and we're drifting towards it and there's no wind and I'm really quite angry at myself actually for letting myself get so close. Absolutely stupid, Mike. Reefs are the worst thing for yachts to collide with. The razor-sharp coral will cut to pieces boats, life rafts, and sailors. I know, you know, I was praying, and my dad was praying back at home, and this school cloud suddenly popped up out of nowhere. Look at that cloud! And it came along and it gave me 30 knots from behind, and we just accelerated off shore. There is thunder and lightning all around us right now. It's... It's a little scary.
the ring of friends. It's as if it's just turned into a wildlife show. later it gets even better we've got some whales by the boat look at this I came on deck and uh, I saw these whales like 10 meters away Wow but uh, I love the sound of the blowhole you know it's just going Oh, wow. Mike moves up into the Labrador current, where he has to be careful of icebergs. I'm coming home! Now he's really on the home straight. But there's one last challenge ahead. I personally found that last couple of weeks, you know, I was on edge, so close to home, yet Hurricane Bill. Let's get a look at the weather forecast now with Wendy Holland. I think it's going to get a little bit choppy out there for Michael over the next 24 hours or so, and this is why Hurricane Bill now passes a tropical storm out in the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, look at this. Only a hurricane between sailor age 17 and a round world record. Can have a look at that? Ta-da! But Mike's now had more experience than most sailors will have in a lifetime. He waits for a day off the continental shelf where the waves pile up, and then slips in behind Bill. I am six hours away from the finish line. And I am just incredibly excited. I've been up all night dodging ships and fishing boats and all manner of other things flowing out here in the big wide ocean. I really, really can't wait for my hug. With Dad, that's what I'm looking forward to most. I also hear that the uh, the Royal Navy is coming out, which is really, really quite something, and I feel honoured. I really do. A Royal Navy patrol ship and Navy helicopter come out to record the official time when Mike crosses the finishing line. At 9.47 and 30 seconds on Thursday the 27th of August 2009, Mike becomes the youngest person to circumnavigate the world, taking the record from Zach Sunderland, who held it for just 10 weeks. It's my turn now. <laughs> I can stop smiling. Despite everything, despite all the hardships, part of me wanted to turn around and just do it again. It was just... Extraordinary, really, for my son who just sailed around the world. This is a hug, Mike. Mike! Oh, hello. Hello, mate. Oh, I love you so much. Me too. Stop leaning that way. <laughs> Let's go this side. Oh, Let's go this side. Come on. Let's go this side for, this, for these cameras. Thanks, mate. Oh, I love you, mate. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Now. With Dad on board, Mike sails round to Portsmouth, where the family are waiting to welcome him back to where he started from more than nine months ago. Uh, I didn't know how I would feel, if it was going to be awkward or if it was going to be fine. Why did you decide to do it? It's just, it's just such an adventure <laughs> and I'm a dreamer. Yeah. I didn't know what he was thinking. He kept looking over. <laughs> I 
that's the hug I've been waiting for. I felt, wow, I've, I've actually done it. 